Um, today we're going to kind of go through um, uh, advances kind of in total joint replacements. We'll start kind of with the knees and then kind of go into the hip replacement surgery. Um, I do a different approach to total hip replacement that we'll kind of focus in at the end. Um, having the unique uh, experience here at the hospital, I do the all throughout, but being at the hospital, it's kind of nice. I have one of my patients here um, that uh, is with us for about next five, ten minutes or so, so I thought he'd come down. He's itching to get out of here. He, was, he had a total hip replacement done yesterday um, through the anterior approach, and he's uh, wanting to get home. So he's kind enough to say, stop by. He had bad um, arthritis in his hips, and uh, Ed's here today. So I just thought we'd show, when we get to the questions at the end here, but this is Ed. And yeah, he had uh, total hip replacement done on. What side was that done, Ed? Yep. He had his right side done. He was up, and uh, bad arthritis for several years, and we'd been treating him with an injection and uh, did a, a hip replacement yesterday with him, and he would have left earlier, but I kept him here a little longer, and uh, <laughs> nice enough to be here and uh, say hi to everybody, and maybe you can just kind of talk about your experience briefly. Okay. Here, just kind of hold well, I walked in here this yesterday morning at uh, 7 o'clock, and I had my operation at 9. I got back to my room about 1.30. I was walking around the hallway about 3 o'clock, and by 8 o'clock at night, I had made it all the way around the building up there. Um, I haven't, uh, this is not a paid infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't really have anything at stake here. I'll, be I'll let you go. I know it's been a long day, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Thanks a lot. You have a good day. Yep. Well, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, exactly. So we're kind of going to get into that. I just had him stop by just because it was convenient and he was upstairs. So um, we'll kind of go through uh, joint pain, treatment options, uh, joint replacement, surgery, what it involves, the uh, modern uh, advances that uh, there are um, with the total joint replacement and knee replacements, um, talking about surgical techniques, anesthesia, um, and what we can do before and after to kind of control the pain. There's a few people, I guess, there. They all have had hips, so there's a little bit more modern day picture. All of them have had hips replacements. Again, all of these <laughs> hip replacements. There's one on the left and the right. Again, both had hip replacements. Be seen probably a little bit more her in the news here recently. And actually, at the end, I'll get into a little bit more. Tom Watson had an anterior total hip replacement. Most of these have had hip replacements, but anti or Tom Watson had an anterior total hip replacement in 2008. Bo Jackson had both his hips done. Dick had his hip done. Coach K had his done. Dan Gable is an Olympic wrestler from Iowa. I did schooling in Iowa in medical school. So, wrestlers, <laughs> Eva Knievel. Yes, everybody has got it. So arthritis affects a lot of people. 37 million people are affected by arthritis. One in seven people are one in three families are affected by arthritis. Um, it's a very, a growing population is affected um, by arthritis and it is only increasing in an exponential form. Second most common diagnosis for pain seen by primary care doctors. Um, number one is back pain. So arthritis, um, this is kind of the wear and tear arthritis that we're dealing with. It's a, it's a, a broad picture. Um, but the most common form is osteoarthritis, wear and tear arthritis just from overuse and the loss of cartilage on the end of the bone. And it's characterized mainly by pain, stiffness, or deformity, or loss of mobility or range of motion in that joint, in the hip or the knee. Normal joints are well lubricated, have healthy cartilage on the end of the bone, and have full range of motion that are relatively pain-free. Arthritic joint is more of a a rusty kind of stiff, loss of motion, pain, creaky, uh, the cartilage or the cushioning on the end of the bone has uh, worn away. Causes of arthritis, this is kind of, uh, everybody asks me, you know, what causes this or how did I come up with this? Um, we don't have any one specific uh, cause for it. There are 
abnormal alignment or anatomy issues that can lead to it. If you have different biomechanics or alignment over the time can cause differences in arthritis. Um, your abnormal biology or, uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis is another type of arthritis where you can have abnormal these in the cartilage lining and things like that that can cause um, arthritis as well. Genetics um, and also just the wear and tear, overuse. As we age, um, you know, the brake tires or the tires or the brake pads are we wearing thin and we just are wearing out the, uh, the cartilage on the end of the bones. Risk factors for arthritis. Um, as we age, that's the wear and tear. As we just put more miles on our joints, we're losing the cushions on the end of the bones and that's what's causing the uh, um, arthritis in the end. Um, obesity or weight gain. Um, any type of, uh, any pound that we gain in weight um, puts about a four, three to four pound pressure on our knees or our um, uh, hip joints themselves. So that's increasing the amount of uh, weight that we, um, that the knees actually feel. Inactivity or uh, lack of exercise is another one. Uh, motion is the key to uh, healthy cartilage and so anything that we can keep activity and exercise and motion is a, a key to healthy cartilage. Prior trauma, um, falls, fractures, broken bones can um, adjust and change the anatomy of the hip and knee itself. And then um, abnor uh, abnormal birth defects or congenital defects that uh, have abnormal alignment of where you carry the majority of your weight can also lead to increased arthritis or loss of the cartilage at the end of the bone. These are common things. Um, how do we know? It's again that pain, stiffled joint, uh, lack of mobility, using uh, different devices to try to get out of uh, low seated cars or low um, seats at any time, getting up and down stairs, um, you know, using your hands a lot more to push yourself up from a seated position um, are all kind of key signs to maybe it's not so much pain, maybe it's just discomfort, maybe it's stiffness, harder to get on shoes and socks. Um, limited mobility to able to get that range of motion or that heel up to where you need to get it. If people are passing you by, walking a little faster, you're not keeping up, you're not able to do some of the things you once were able to do. How do we know it? Um, basically, we just kind of described how we feel it and how we kind of can kind of know if something's wrong um, or something's uh, slowing us down. Basically, it's just a simple x-ray that can kind of tell me a lot of things, and it's just an x-ray of the knee or the hip or, you know, just a simple um, office visit where I just kind of put your knee or hip through a range of motion, and we have x-ray in our office, and you just go five steps away and get an x-ray, and I can see a lot of uh, cartilage loss on the end of the bone based on just a simple x-ray and an exam in the office. So it's not that tricky. It's very, uh, very easy to diagnose. Um, it, uh, you know, is very. Uh, it's just an office exam with a doctor where you just kind of your primary care doctor can do a lot of this as well. Just kind of arrange the motion of the knee or the hip and and uh, see if there's stiffness um, in that hip, if there's pain that causes it, and get a history and see are you taking some medicines and things like that for it. And then the simple X-ray, um, having that done in the office, is very convenient. So again, the history, we kind of went through some of this, the pain, um, how often it's occurring, if it's every day, does it take uh, medicines to kind of control the pain, the stiffness, um, inactivity, um, and, and you're just not doing the things that you want to be doing. And, and exercise is key to the health. Uh, staying active and healthy and mobility is, uh, is a big key factor in any, all your other medical problems. So keeping you active is kind of the key to all of this. Physical exam is simple range of motion. In the hip and the knee, how far it bends, how far it straightens out. Does it straighten out all the way? Does it bend all the way? Am I not able to get it all the way straight as I once was? These are uh, very key factors of uh, seeing if you have cartilage loss on the end of the bone. Also, if the knee is crooked or misshapen or deformity, basically I'm becoming more bow-legged with time or I'm getting more knock kneed um, These are fancy terms for knock kneed on the, on the, I guess your left there. Um, is the knock knee term is valgus and uh, varus is the term for uh, more being bow legged and uh, normal is in the middle there. So if we're getting more deformity in our knees, that's very common. The x rays here are uh, very uh, telling as well. This is a normal knee, this is a right knee. Um, you can kind of see at the top there is the thigh bone or the shin bone, and then there's the tibia or the 
uh, uh, leg bone there between the two is a space, and this space there is cartilage there. You can see a nice space between the two ends of the bone that's not air, that's cartilage on the end of the bone, that's the white gristle on the end of the chicken bone, very similar. We have cartilage on the end of that bone, cushiness and keeping a space between those bones from rubbing on each other. The cartilage has no nerve endings. That's why we don't have uh, pain when we normally walk. The, the bone does, and when bone starts rubbing on the bone, that can cause p significant pain, and that's what you can see here. This uh, majority of arthritis is isolated into one compartment in the knee and the inside of the knee. So this patient would be more bow-legged um, because all that wear is on the inside of the knee where the bone is rubbing, where you have a pretty decent space on the outside. This is just an x-ray showing a normal knee on the left kind of progressing through um, to a total uh, knee replacement on the right. So um, we have nice cartilage on the, uh, on the normal knee on the left and that red is supposed to represent where the bone has degenerated down or the cartilage has degenerated down to the bone where the red is the exposed bone and uh, we have another lesion on the tibia which is not shown in this x-ray but where that red is rubbing when we move our knee is what's scraping and what's causing all the pain um, because the nerve um, fibers are, are exposed um, into the bone because that cushion is gone. On the right we'll get into a little bit more of this. We resurface the end of the bone with metal, put a pl piece of plastic in the between and then a piece of metal on the end. Hip replacement, or this is a normal hip, sorry. Um, the hip surface there is with the, the I, if I had a pointer, I don't know, does this thing have that? There we go. So there's that space between the cup and ball. So the hip joint's a ball and socket joint. So what we're looking at is that space of you know, a centimeter there or so between the two um, is showing that cartilage again. That's not air, that's the cushion in between a normal hip. And you can kind of see where, that, whoop, where that's whitened out and no space left, especially up in here. And that's where we can carry most of our weight, where the cushion is rubbing the bone up and through here. It's gotten marbleized because it's gotten so hard because there's no cushion there left. Again, this is the normal hip hip that's degenerated and then this is what a hip replacement looks like and we have a lot more pictures of this but what we do is put a metal cup in there with a plastic liner, a stem down into the bone here and this is, becomes a new hip socket so the metal is wearing on the plastic, not the bone rubbing against the bone. So there's several things that we can do. So um, you know arthritis is uh, treated basically when we got to the point where the car left off the end of the bone, there's not any procedure that we can do for the most part to put cartilage back onto the bone. Um, and once it's worn thin, the tire treads are gone or the um, brake pads are gone, so to speak. The cartilage is, is gone and we can't replace that. So what we're doing is the damage is done, but we're trying to modify the pain of arthritis. And how do we do that? There's several different things that we can do to try to help arthritis. Surgery is something that will completely solve the cause of why the pain is happening. Other than that, anything shy of surgery is just kind of a band-aid thing to kind of take care of, you know, modify your pain of arthritis. And we have several different things. Number one is education yourself, coming to these kinds of classes and educating yourself about the process. Weight loss, that's a big one. Um, like I said before, any pound that we, we lose is translated to about four pounds of pressure that our joints feel. Physical therapy can assist that. A lot of patients tell me, well, I'm in so much pain in my hips and knees, how can I lose the weight? Well, it can be a downward cycle because I'm painful, therefore I can't exercise, and then we just, and then the weight gain, actually. And so it can be a downward spiral, but there's aquatic therapy that can help, and getting into a pool will allow some buoyancy to allow some pressure off the joints that will allow uh, an area of activity, so to speak, to a, in a more pain-free environment home modifications like elevated seats and things like that. These are just modifications in the home to help you get around to help with the limited mobility, assisted devices, cane, walkers, crutches, these types of things. Braces, um, I use these in some patients where the, some braces can offload um, some of the knee joint um, where pressure on the inside of the uh, joint itself and also foot arthroses can help with unloading some of the uh, knee joint as well. So these are kind of non-drug related treatments. These are some of the modifications we went through. This is a brace that can unload 
the inside of the knee, this is the elevated toilet seat, canes, walkers, those types of things, and then the pool therapy down there. Different types of drugs. So there's pain medicines, and those are in the category of kind of the Tylenol, or then you can get into narcotic pain medicine. And both of those are uh, something that I avoid on the first, first time around. Tylenol is not a bad one to try. Um, but uh, narcotics, once we get into that, then we're kind of depending on a narcotic to solve our pain, and we can build up a tolerance over time with that, and that can be difficult. Uh, and you can get addicted um, issues with that. Uh, Anti-inflammatory medicines, the NSAID, this is a big category of medicines. Um, Over-counters are ibuprofen, Aleve, naproxen, Advil. Advil. Um, we can go on and on. There's um, Celebrex, Mobic are the prescription strength medicines. Um, these are anti-inflammatory medicines to try to help uh, stop the inflammation of arthritis. Itis is an inflammation, and so the pain is caused by inflammatory markers in the knee and the hip, and these medicines try to cool those down. Oral steroids is a big hose to the cooling down the fire of arthritis, and those can be in the form of injections or pills. Um, injections we do a lot of into the knee itself, um, and the cortisone injection is one of those. There's also visco supplementation injections, a fancy word for lubricating in, uh, injections, which is usually a series of injections of three to five injections. There is a one-time injection that's currently out now. These have multiple different brand names. And they, all, they don't do anything to replace the cartilage on the end of the bone. These are all pain relievers in the sense of trying to cool the arthritis pain down or help lubricating and also helping with the pain control as well. Oral, uh, oral steroids, if you take that for other conditions like lung or pulmonary issues or different diagnoses, you can have um, a condition. I just did the other patient uh, that was here today, I did a total hip on him yesterday as well. He had avascular necrosis of the femoral head or death of the bone due to lack of blood supply. And that can be caused by a lot of different things. Alcohol and steroid use are one of the most common diagnoses for that. It can cause significant pain and be a big reason for um, uh, a need for a total hip replacement. It's a different diagnosis than osteoarthritis or arthritis per se, but it definitely is a cause for a total hip replacement. So it can definitely lead to uh, death of the femoral head. We'll get in some of those in a little bit soon. Pain medicine, this is again, Altram is another one. It's a milder form of a narcotic. Um, a Tylenol is over a counter form. Anti inflammatories, these are some of the more common brand out there. We use these uh, pretty extensively. Cortisone injections, we kind of went over as well, uh, limiting to about three to four a year, every three to four months or so. Um, every time we do it again, uh, the returns on the benefits, it decreases somewhat. Um, uh, these usually last four to six weeks. They could be enough to cool down and plateau the pain of arthritis for uh, several times. Every patient's variable in how they respond to these. Um, it's typically done in the office. It's a simple uh, injection into the knee. It seems like it would be painful. The knee joint's very big. The bigger the joint, the less painful the injection is. Um, it's a bigger spa space to get into. The needle's relatively small, and we can use some anesthetic spray and it's, uh, you'd be very surprised on how easy we do these in the office. Lubricating injections, these are multiple different brands. These are kind of the, the, the ones that you hear about on the, uh, they're all over the TV and the ads now. They're the lubricating, they're kind of, uh, your normal joints have synovial fluid in it. It's kind of the consistency of motor oil is kind of how it feels. Um, and this is a lubricating medicine that kind of replenishes that uh, uh, fluid in the knee. Nothing restoring the cartilage on the end of the bone. This is, again, just helping with the pain. Glucosamine chondroitin is another big one out there. Um, this is in all kinds of form. You can drink it in osteobiflex. You can buy it in pills. You can take them on a daily basis. Does it work? Um, it's, again, we're working it, and you hear it here. It's chart cartilage or this and that. It's, it's nothing that's going to replace the cartilage on the end of the bone. It's, again, working on the anti-inflammatory anti effects to help with the pain. And so, uh, you know, does it work? Um, it has very few side effects, so it's um, one of these things where if you'd like to um, purchase this and try it, I say try it for two to three weeks or so. See if you like it. Try it on a daily basis. 
It's one of those things where it's not going to maybe be the magic bullet for you, so to speak, but um, it's one of those things where it's worth um, trying for a significant period of time. And you may actually know the benefits off of it when you stop it. And when you stop it for a week or two, you may say, oh, wow, I'm, I'm in a lot more pain than I was, you know, two or three weeks ago when I was on this originally. And it, you may feel the effects of it more that way and say, well, I need to go back on that because that was very, uh, a lot, you know, you know, helping you out a lot more with the pain. Um, once you've gone off of it more than you're on it and you're like, oh, I feel great. It's not usually that effect. This is just a graph saying that uh, my job's in security, I guess. I don't know. Um, uh, there's uh, patients, uh, the total number of total hip replacements are just going to uh, increase um, as, you know, exponentially here. Um, you can kind of see the total hip replacements were about a half of a million, um, and those are just estimated to jump. Uh, um, and then the knee replacement, oh, I'm sorry, the total hip replacements, I'm sorry, 300,000 knee replacements are more common at half a million. In the year 2030, it's supposed to, uh, looks like it's going to be close to double and the knees are going to dramatically go up. And we're kind of going to get into a little bit of uh, surgery and surgery can be scary. And this one is a good one. Um, surgery, there's no turning back after surgery. and so. Um, you know, all those things that I just mentioned are worth uh, a try. We're not burning any bridges. Once we decide on surgery, um, there's no turning back. Um, it's not like I can undo a knee replacement. Arthroscopy is more of a relatively minor procedure. Um, it's two poke holes in the front of the knee. It's an outpatient procedure. It usually takes less than an hour and you go home that same day with minimal restrictions. Typically, we don't, you know, do a whole lot of arthroscopy just for degenerative knees or hips. Um, once the cartilage is gone, we kind of know that, but there are other structures in the knee called meniscus. These are rubber washers, so to speak, um, between the two ends of the bones. Other cartilage cushions that can be torn, and you can get mechanical symptoms. And if this is the case, you can have um, mechanical symptoms. It's kind of like a pebble in the shoe, so to speak, and if that's more of the problem that you're having, we can go in there with a lighted telescope and a shaver and remove that uh, pebble in the shoe or that tear in the meniscus. And we can shave that out if that's the majority of your symptoms. Even though your cartilage is lost on the end of the bone, um, it can be helpful for other diagnoses besides osteoarthritis. Um, osteotomies, that kind of gets into uh, cutting bone, resetting it um, to make your alignment overall. This is more for younger patients to have done um, if they have abnormal anatomy or alignment or deformity at a young age where their cartilage is preserved, we want to preserve that so we want to straighten out their anatomy so they don't um, further progress in time and develop osteoarthritis. So it's a preserving type thing to the cartilage itself. Partial knee replacement, total knee replacement, we're going to get into quite heavily. These are the terms, um, you've heard all kinds of terms I'm sure, minimally invasive, uh, uh, less invasive search for muscle sparing approaches. Um, I can get into all of those, but tip, the simple terminology in the broad categories is partial knee replacement and total knee replacement. Partial knee replacement, three compartments in the knee, inside, outside, and under the kneecap. And if you have arthritis in all of these compartments, then you're kind of more of a candidate for a total knee replacement. The total knee replacement resurfaces all three of the um, compartments of the knee. Partial knee replacement just focuses on one isolated compartment, inside, the outside, medial, or lateral, or under the kneecap. And sometimes we have combined um, prosthesis that can, is called a, a deuce or a t dewey or a uni compartment is one compartment that's a partial, and we also have some that can do two. Hip resurfacing um, is uh, the terminology for a bone preserving uh, uh, surgery in the hip. Um, we can get into that a little bit more as well. And then the total hip replacement, we don't have so many options in the, with, uh, and we also have hip arthroscopy as well. These are not uh, suggested reasons to have a total joint uh, done. Um, so you could have friends telling you that you need to have it. You could have Ed saying it's the best thing in the world. Um, these are not reasons to have total um, uh, hip replacements. Um, especially if I say, uh, you know, if you go to any surgeon and he sells you for a hip replacement, you shouldn't be seeing that surgeon, I don't think, or he's not busy enough because the surgeon should be the last one to talk you into it. Um, you can kind of go over the, you know, the, the whole algorithm with you, kind of the before and after, and kind of make a personal individual. This is how I kind of approach it. Everybody has a different reason or a cause or a pain, and we have an individual set up uh, thing or we have, I go over the whole gamut of what we can do and we kind of uh, choose and decide on a, 
individual basis for each patient. Better reasons. You're not doing the things you want to be doing. Your quality of life is affected. You're not out uh, doing the things that you want to be doing. In the old dogma of I should wait to have a hip replacement or a knee replacement. I'm too young. Um, uh, these, that old dogma I'm not in, in favor of a lot anymore. It's hard for me to kind of push somebody that's in debilitating pain that can't get around and do the things I want to be doing and not offer them a replacement surgery where they can be walking the next day and doing very well um, in their younger years and enjoying their younger years opposed to waiting in misery um, a lot of times in, their, in, in relatively young age. The person that I did last yesterday was 37 um, and he had horrible debilitating pain. Knee replacement surgery, um, again, we're kind of going to the specifics. This is an x-ray after the surgery itself, so we're recapping the end of the thigh bone, the tibia, the leg bone. In between there, we see that space again. That space isn't cartilage this time. It's still not air, and this time it's made of a plastic disc that goes in there, and that's where the technology has really um, increased in the last 10 years, where we have better plastics now, and so that's where the longevity of these knee replacement replacements last a lot longer because of the wear of the plastic is a lot better and they're typically cemented onto the end of the bone. There's a lot of terminology out there. Now we even hear about custom knee implants um, and these are all terminologies that are used. Historically um, what we have done in total hip or a total knee replacement rather is at the time of surgery we use our instruments to size the end of the bone. So everybody has a different size knee, they have a different size bony anatomy and what, just like we have different size clothing, um, what we do is uh, at the time of surgery with our instruments size the end of the implants with the size of your bone and we've normally just then gone to the shelf and pulled off size 8 or whatever number that it is. <clears throat> and so now we're getting into more custom implants or um, where we can uh, make these determinations before surgery with CT, MRI. We can go and have the patient get this done and we can get the size of your knee specifically with a CT or MRI and get that size 8 known to me ahead of, before me going into surgery. And then we have custom molds that can be made by the manufacturer that we can go and make the cuts that I use on the end of the bone to make these cuts but before, or you know, at the time of surgery, I normally make those cuts. Now I have a mold to kind of help guide me make those cuts. And so it's basically helping me at the time of surgery to make these cuts ahead of time and maybe speeding up the time of surgery a little bit. But that's the, what a custom implant is. It's not necessarily an implant that's designed for your knee. We do have those. Those are not usually what we're talking about because I still go and grab a size 8 off the shelf and put that in your knee. So it's not a custom implant that was made specifically for you. You had molds made for you based off your CT that helped me at the time of surgery. And so that's what they're talking about. And partial uh, knee replacements we've kind of gone into. The old technique, here's all the instruments. This is the tools. I use these every day um, uh, going in. Um, these are saw bones, so this is not a real knee there. But um, using these drills and cutting guides and things to fit the size or at, of the end of the bone. Here is it, how it looks just kind of set up, and this is how we do it. And this is a newer way of doing it with MRI or CT. We go in and do those exact same measurements and, and with the uh, instrumentation of the MRI or a CT now. And um, those are the molds that we can use on the end of the bone um, and to make those cuts that we need to do. And there's the cuts shown. And I have all this mapped out on, on, on my computer on an MRI and CT. And I can see all the cuts that I want to make and I can modify that based off the software based off my computer screen with the company. And that's how the implant would look off an of MRI or CT based off of a patient. There's all kinds of claims with custom knee implants. Again, typically, that's all the difference really it is. It's getting the sizing ahead of the surgery before the implants usually still come off the size. And it just tells me you're a size 8 before me getting in there and knowing you're a size 8 can shorten the length of surgery a little bit, maybe lengthen the blood loss because the surgery is a little shorter and improves accuracy a little bit overall as well of the positioning of how the implants are uh, put into the knee itself. Gender knees, that's another big one out there as well. Um, 
uh, one of the companies that specifically has uh, really uh, marketed this terminology. Um, as it says up there, women pre receive over half of the total knee replacements uh, performed in this country. Um, female anatomy is, n is different than male anatomy, and so they have narrower and different ratios that are accustomed. And some of these implant companies are uh, adjusting their implants to modify for these uh, different angles in the tibia and the femur. Partial knee replacement, we talked briefly about this. This is when we're talking about replacing one of the compartments in the knee where the total knee replacement would do inside, outside, and then under the kneecap, all three areas. Partial knee replacement would focus on one of these areas, the inside, outside, or under the kneecap. Partial knee replacement, there's the x-ray of it. There's the bad arthritis on the inside of the knee, bone rubbing against bone, nice space on the outside of the knee. Partial knee replacement there, total knee replacement here. Partial knee replacement surgery is a lot uh, smaller incision, a lot quicker recovery. Hospital stays are usually overnight, go home the same day. Knees don't recover quite as fast as hips, so they usually stay in the hospital two days and go home the third day or so. Um, so the recovery and, and partial knee replacement, we save the two big ligaments in your knee, ACL and PCL, so it's a more natural feeling knee as well. So there are some benefits, but there are some downsides as well. If you had arthritis and the other, you would not be a candidate. There's se several criteria of being a candidate for a partial versus a total. I think I just stated most of those. Less invasive, quicker recovery, did I miss? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, recovery after total knee replacement. This is just averages. Everybody responds differently. Two to three days, um, two nights, usually go home the third day. Um, usually stand and walk on it the day after surgery, um, start bending it and moving it um, very quickly after the surgery, um, and you'd be permitted to do golf, walk, swim, bike, all those types of things afterwards as well. Getting into total hip replacement surgery. Um, you know, this is where we're going to talk a little bit about the anterior approach versus other approaches to total hip replacement. And when it's all said and done, the work's the same. The, the parts and the pieces, the surgery itself, it's just how we're doing the parts and the pieces. So what we do is remove that bad head, cut the head right here, and then what we have to do is remove that bone and put a stem down the bone here, a cup here, and have a liner with a head. And there's different bearing surfaces we'll get into as well. Um, but this, that portion, those steps that I just went through is the same in any total hip replacement surgery. That has to be done no matter what. Mini incision, minimally invasive, muscle sparing, these are all terms that are used. Um, it's basically um, all, you want a surgery to get those parts and pieces in the perfect alignment. And if the surgeon can't see what he's doing, there's a very high likelihood of the parts not being in a correct alignment or a higher rate of failure, I guess, so to speak, after a hip replacement. And so we need to see what we need to see and how we do that. We don't have the trick of, uh, you know, putting a boat in a bottle, so to speak. So the incision can get so small, sure. The, the, the implants are, you know, this big. And so <laughs> you can't, you have to put the parts in uh, an in, in excision that it can't get much. If somebody asks how big your incision is. It's not so much an incision is not the importance. Um, it, it, skin heals no matter what. It's more of what we do under the skin itself, and we'll get into that a little bit more. What muscles we're destroying, what muscles we're detaching or cutting to get to do the work that we want to do. And the skin incision, we ha still have to make a skin incision to put those stems and the parts and pieces in there that are of a decent size. And so there, we, we don't have little, little little uh, incisions to put in big parts and pieces. It's physically impossible. We'll never be able to do that. Bearing surfaces. Um, uh, this is a long conversation. This could take an hour right here. But there's different bearing surfaces. There's metal on metal hip bearing surfaces. There's ceramic on plastic, metal on plastic, ceramic on ceramic. These are, we could go on all day, and maybe if you have questions at the end, we can go a little bit about these. But um, there's a lot of concern about metal-on-metal metal hip replacements now, um, and uh, some of the recalls that you see on TV every night have to do with some of those models. Um, and so I do not put, um, I am not a uh, person that puts in metal-on-metal metal hip replacements. I do, a uh, majority of probably 98% of mine fall right in here with a ceramic on plastic um, or a metal on plastic but I do not do metal and metal, and we can get into those reasons later. Anterior approach to total hip replacement. Um, again, this is, uh, let me see where, anterior total hip, uh, 
So it's the approach. It's how we get to do the total hip replacement. Anterior just means front. Posterior just means back. I make the incision through the front. There's also a lateral or the side or back. So there's three main traditional approaches. Anterior is through the front, lateral is through the side, posterior is through the back. Majority of surgeons in this country do a posterior or a lateral approach. It's usually in the back or buttock area or on the side. And when we cut the skin, we have to go through the largest muscles in your body, your glute maximus and your external rotators. We have to cut these muscles and detach these muscles from their origins to get to do that work that I was describing before. When we put, do the, get done with the work, we have to reattach all these muscles and then suture up the skin. That detachment, that rehabilitation takes a lot longer to recover from. Um, it, can take four to, uh, it can take up to four to six months to recover from. You can even have limps afterwards because the muscle not healing properly um, and not uh, recovering pr properly from. With the anterior approach, I make the incision through the front. The muscles in the front are a lot more strap muscles. They're not the biggest muscles in your body. They're important muscles, but they're strap muscles in the sense that they allow pliability for me to allow simply to spread them apart, not detach any of them, do the work that I need to do. They fall back where they need to be, and we suture up the skin. So there's usually just a cut in the skin and not any detachment of any muscle. That affords a lot of different things. The rate of dislocation or coming in and out of the socket or popping in and out of joint afterwards a lot lower because we're not violating any of the muscle, uh, musculature of this approach. R precautions afterwards, you can see Ed, I allow him to put as much weight bearing as he can tolerate on that leg. He, he has no precautions from my end. He can put his leg in any, most any position. He can walk. Um, he can put uh, his full weight bearing on the day of surgery. You just heard him. He was up walking the day of surgery. Not the day after, the day of, that evening. It does, is a little bit more technical um, approach. There's not many surgeons that you can ask why doesn't all surgeons do it this way. It kind of has to do with your training and where you've uh, trained to do this. It's a lot tech, more technical uh, uh, a procedure to do. It takes a little longer. I have x-ray at the time of surgery to allow me to do this. It has a high-tech table to use um, that Holland Hospital has actually purchased one for traditionally. Um, the surgery is done laying on your side uh, with the hip contorted in all different uh, positions um, to get that done. This is the table that I use. You're laying on your back. You put in ski boots and you're allowed to have full range of motion of that hip. It's very actually, looks kind of like a torture device, but it's actually more comfortable than this laying on your side on the side here. You're actually laying on your back and it, those, those legs aren't really stretched out like it likes to show. <laughs> um, a uh, little bit of a background. Um, this isn't anything new. It dates back to 47 in France. Um, and then it was modernized. Dr. Mata actually trained out in Europe. He's uh, in Santa Monica. Um, I did a little training out in LA uh, as well in residency. And um, they, it's not uncommon for him to do both the hips done at the same surgery. Um, and uh, it's uh, gaining, gaining in popularity, it's very common in the West Coast, now in the East Coast, and now it's filtering to the Midwest. I'm one of the only surgeons in Michigan doing it right now. Less trauma to the body, smaller incision, um, faster recovery. These are all the things that we just kind of mentioned. Um, downsides, uh, relatively new procedure. Again, one of the, if you're a surgeon that's just been out for a while, done it through other approaches. Um, it's not one of those things where you can pick up in a weekend course or something like that. It's taken me <coughs> several, uh, you know, it's not one of those, it's, it's not an easy one to pick up. Last year I spent and did probably, I don't know, three to four hundred of these in my fellowship training. Um, and then now I've gone to several courses and been an instructor at these courses for other surgeons. And it still takes a number of uh, cases under your belt to feel comfortable with this approach. It's not something easily learned. Recovery has more to do with it than just the approach. Yes, it has a lot to do with the muscle sparing type approach to it, um, where you're not cutting the muscle, and that's why you have relatively low pain. Um, after the surgery, you, you just heard Ed, he took maybe one pain medicine afterwards and a Tylenol, because I made him take one today. Um, the reason that that is, the muscle's not cut, so there's not a lot of trauma to it. I also do um, a spinal injection um, for anesthesia where you're not completely gone under um, general anesthetic where they're breathing tube and things like that. You usually have a spinal injection where it's numbing medicine in your legs, 
you're taking a nap during the case, but nobody's breathing for you, no machine is. And when you recover, your legs are still numb. Um, at the time of the injection, I put an injection into the incision itself. And um, you're feeling, you don't have all the nausea and the side effects of the general anesthetic and you're very much with it and able to walk around the day of surgery and get around and um, tolerate pain medicine if we need to um, put those on board. But there's problems with pain medicine, getting nausea and vomiting and things like that as well. And so the, the more we can get this at a comprehensive level of uh, multimodal sort of effect of uh, affecting a lot of different pain sites, the better. This is just kind of a general outline in recovery. Walking with a walker or a cane. Um, Ed was walking with a cane here just now, so he was in the 24-hour period walking with a cane. These are all general averages. Uh, walking unassisted, uh, three to four weeks. Uh, driving, four to, week, four to weeks, that, that varies too. I've had patients come driving at three weeks, uh, two to three weeks. You have to be off the narcotic pain medicine. You have to feel comfortable and safe to do this. Returning to work varies. Golfing, you can see these averages here. Like I said before, Tom Watson had one done in 2008, and uh, this is after he did pretty well there, I think. Um, again, this is an uh, informative lecture. Um, we have guidebooks. We have a, Christy, she failed to mention who she was. She's the joint coordinator at the hospital. Um, and uh, she has a lot to do with uh, putting uh, booklets together, education, putting classes together where we have a, um, a well-rounded approach to to total joint hip and knee patients here at the hospital. There's her information. There's a little bit more about me. I can bring that back. But we can open it up for questions now as well. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. I get that one quite a bit actually. So knee resurfacing is that's a, just a, that's just a, like all I said all those other things. I do there is hip resurfacing. There is not really a, a technique called knee resurfacing. Um, I hear what you're saying. It, I guess what I was using a lot of terminology there, where we're cutting into the bone and recapping it with metal, recapping it with metal, and putting a piece of plastic in. Um, that terminology is specific, and I forgot my models, which is unfortunate. Um, hip resurfacing is one that doesn't cut the head. It just reshapes the end of the bone and puts a metal cap on the end of the bone and puts a cup in there. Um, there was a picture of it earlier that's a little different than total hip replacement. Um, it preserves a little bone, but usually you have to do those through big incisions. Um, and it's the only option there is metal on metal. And so those have kind of gone on a little bit out of favor. So with my anterior approach, I really, I do hip resurfacing, but I've not done a whole lot of that. Knee, in the knee realm, it's kind of the terminology sticks with partial knee replacement, where we're just resurfacing inside, outside, or under the kneecap. Yes, you can use re resurfacing because all we're doing is cutting or reshaping into the bone and putting that in. That's the word. That's what we're doing. But that, that terminology hasn't transferred to knees. How much bone do you take out? Is that blocking here? Removing bone. Removing bone. Um, uh, with a knee replacement, it's all different. If it's, uh, all these surgeries, typically, if it's the, your primary surgery or the first surgery that you had on your hip or your knee, we take out very m little bone. We are basically just cutting the end of the bone to make a nice flat surface or a carpentry cut, so to speak, to put our implant on with cement. And so we're really just kind of reshaping it a little bit to fit the prosthesis in a, in a very exact way. So the amount of physical bone that we're removing is very little, millimeters of you know, uh, thickness. Uh-huh. On a hip replacement, what Yep, and that's a good question. And so I kind of breezed over the bearing surface um, picture there with the ceramic on plastic, the ceramic on ceramic, um, the metal on metal. These are the bearing surfaces. So when people usually ask me, how long does a knee last? How long does a hip last? Those are all good questions. Usually what they're asking me is, how, well, well, how I see it as is, how long does that piece of plastic last? Because that's what's wearing out. What we wore out was the cartilage in our own body. That's the piece of plastic that we're wearing, going to wear on in a mechanical device now. So it's the metal rubbing on the plastic. It's a ceramic rubbing on the plastic. And how long does that, because that wears out. That's not forever. The cartilage is the best thing that wears. That's the best wearing surface we have. And when we wore that out after 60 years or you know, 70 years or however old we are, that's the best, that's the best product we have. And now we're putting our body in, with a mechanical device. 
plastic and metal. How long is that piece of plastic lasting us? And that's your question uh, to a certain extent. And that's not an easy question because I'll tell you that in a minute. The newer plastics that we have are very um, good and they test these in the lab over millions of cycles and can um, duplicate how, but nothing's like a normal knee in, in the lab, but our lab values, you can see these datas on the new plastics in the knees that say this is a 30 year knee, you know, they make these claims. Well, that means it went through a million cycles is a normal cycle load for a year of wear on somebody. And they could put this knee through a million, the 30 million cycles and say the plastic's not wearing much, but that's in the lab. So how long do they last? I don't know is a good question, is a good answer. But uh, our, we have good data, long-term data in the hips in the newer plastics that are lasting. The new plastics we have only had about 10 or 15 years implanted in patients. And the, the wear rates of those used to, the plastic used to have the wear rate as it goes time, the graph just went like this. Now, the newer plastics, they wear about like that in the first year, and for the 10, 15 years, it's just been a flat line. So they're not wearing a whole lot, which is a good thing. Now, in 15 years, is it going to go up? I don't know. Is it going to continue like that? Probably. That's what they've been doing for the last 10, 15 years, but I don't know. Um, but 20 or 30 years is very easy. A concept to get um, a longer lasting, so to speak, in these newer plastics that we're using. I'll put a caveat on what he just said. So um, that's just the how long they last. That's just the movement of the joints. That's how, if everything went well, that's how long it lasts. They can fail for ze several different reasons. Infection, the parts coming loose, so they're cemented or the, they're fixed in and the bone tries to grow on into a hip, tries to become one. Well, that can come loose over time. So Components can fail for multiple different reasons. The question of how long they last is usually a pointed question, and most surgeons just answer it with, yeah, it'll last you your lifetime, forget about it. Well, that's a easy answer, but that's not, it's not an easy answer because there's multiple reasons why they fail. You could get an infection into your hip or knee, and then that's a reason for failure. So I, and, and loosening of the components, they can have fracture. You can have all kinds of different complications as the years go. And I usually say it's about a percentage point um, per year, so say in 20, uh, the likelihood of you having what hip or knee you had in 20 years from now, what, what percentage on that is, taking all accounts into factor, I say it's probably 80% chance that you would have the hip or knee that you have in now in 20 years from now. So it's, so it's one percentage per year minus. See that? Okay. Other questions? Yep. 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 So there's minimally, you know, so minimally invasive. Um, minimally invasive usually just refers to the size incision. There's a question over here about size of incision. Minimally invasive usually talks about size of incision. And so I, in, I want to get away from the importance of the length of the incision because that is. I understand from a cosmetic standpoint that, and, and from a link standpoint of how big of an incision you're going to have on your knee or your hip, you know, that can be, you know, that's just what you see. But it's more on what, I'd rather have a bigger incision and me not cut less muscle underneath the skin and able to see and put the parts and pieces in the, how I need to put them than to have a tiny incision, me not able to see it, the components, eh, you know, and, and then the muscles being cut or traumatized a lot more because I, I compromised my, me being able to see. So minimally invasive in the past have turned to smaller incisions. And none of my incisions or most surgeons these days are the big incisions that we used to do in the past for total hip replacements 10, 15 years ago. Most incisions are down to seven or eight inches now. My incision routinely for the, the anterior approach is about four inches. So it's about half of that. So it is a minimally concern, you know, surgery. But it's more than that. I'm not cutting the muscle. I'm more concerned with that than the actual length of the incision. The knees also, you can have some of that. And so the smaller incision, minimally invasive. But it's amount of how much muscle we're cutting underneath there as well. And there's different approaches for that too, about how much muscle we're detaching in the knee. Same, same as the hip. The approach to the knee is pretty, pretty straightforward. The incision's usually always in the front, right, right in the front, right over across the knee. And then there's different approaches in the knee and how we're going to go through that quadricep muscle. Yep. Uh-huh. Okay. Risk of infection? Yes. Um, yep. 
That's routinely regulated. Every patient now is, um, Christy could tell you at nauseum on this, that it's um, every patient to hear, is our rate still 100%? It's always been 100% of giving antibiotics before, during, and after. So we give a dose of antibiotics before we make the incision. We give an antibiotic dose after. And this is all regulated and controlled. And so this is a federal regulation that all total joint replacements, hips or knees, get antibiotics before, during, and after for a 24-hour period. And another question on the antibiotics, I recommend having antibiotics before any dental procedures or any invasive colonoscopy, urology kind of procedures after you have a hip replacement. Um, and I recommend that for life. And that, uh, the academy says two years, I recommend it for life just because taking an antibiotic or a pill before that procedure is a lot easier to do than getting a hip infection or a knee infection. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so uh, simultaneous having both knees done at the same time. Um, I, you can do that. You can do knees at both at the same time. Um, there are um, increased risk of having both of those done at the same time. It depends. I, I, again, I individualize that with the patient. I kind of go over it uh, with them. Um, the risk of obviously um, going through one, you really don't have a good one that you're kind of both limited a little bit afterwards with rehab. So rehab can be a little bit delayed having both of them done at the same time. You can have some medical complications be at increased risk with a little bit more blood loss and possibility of other complications, medically speaking, because it's such a hit or trauma to your body because you're having, you know, major hour and a half surgery done on each knee, so to speak, and the surgery takes a lot longer. And if you're healthy enough to support that, that's, uh, that's an option. Um, other option is, uh, but it's also on a social uh, level as well, getting back to work and doing those things or how much, you know, you're out of the game, so to speak. It, the recovery can be a lot longer. Um, my preference, if I had a preference, but it's an individual thing that I talk to the patient and lay it all out there with them, is that um, you have one done, you recover from that, and maybe six weeks later we do the other one. Um, just from a medical standpoint, risk of heart attacks and things like that, complications afterwards because it's such a hit on your system are a little bit lower. But yes, you, they have been done and they're, they're very successful. It's hard for me to say one way or the other. It's a, it's a, I do it on an individual basis on that. With the patient. Uh huh. Two questions. One is what's the percentage on the hip and knee operation? Oh, oh uh, the, the amount I perform just right. based on hips and knees. Um, I would say typically most uh, joint surgeons, I would say in this country, unless they're highly spe you know, specific, some of the patients or the surgeons that I trained with, all they do is hips or they, all they do is knees. Um, so they've gotten very, sub they don't just do right hips or left knees or, or, or just the one side. They haven't gotten that specialized. But um, majority of the surgeons in this country who are joint trained probably do probably 75% knees, 25% hips. Um, and that was that statistic that knees are a lot more common um, than hip surgery. In my practice, I would say that's almost flipped. I would say I do a lot more hip um, procedures than I do knee replacements. And that's just because I do this anterior approach or something a little, I, I do partial knee replacements on all kinds of knee replacements as well. I'm just uh, one of the only surgeons in Michigan that do this anterior approach. So my hip patient base has been traveling for far and wide, so to speak, to have this done. So I, uh, my practice is a little different. Yeah, shoulders, um, shoulders are less common to have, uh, you can get arthritis in the shoulder, I don't want to say that. They're just less common number-wise just because it's not a weight-bearing. We don't walk on our arms, right? So um, we wear out our hips and our knees, and that's why it degenerates a lot quicker. We're not using our arms for weight-bearing, and so arthritis to get in the shoulder can happen, especially if we're a laborer or rheumatoid arthritis or different diagnosis, but it's just a lot less common procedure to do. Um, we do have resurfacing in the shoulder, there's resurfacing in the shoulder, there's total shoulder replacements, and there's also something called reverse total sh um, shoulder replacement. So there are a lot of different procedures for the shoulder as well. Just a lot less common just because of the, we walk on our knees, and, you know, on our legs, so the hips and knees are affected more. Uh -huh. Does arthritis cause bone and shoulder? Yep, so so yeah, so on one of those x-rays I had it where it was a bone rubbing against bone, that's the joint space narrowing where the the bone's rubbing against the bone. It can cause, these are just terminology, sclerosis or marveling or that hardening or that whitening of the bone. It also can cause bone spurs that we see on x-rays as well. Usually bone spurs are abundance of overgrowth of abundance due to the stress that we put on our knees that the bones just start to 
grow a little bit. Usually spurs or osteophytes, we call them, are not um, painful per se, but they are a sign of arthritis on x-ray that we use. Uh -huh. Yep, yep. Yep. Uh, typically, I have a lot of patients that come in, I don't have pain. Okay, and they're walking, you know, there's, you know, hobbling in, bare, I, no, I have no pain. Okay, you don't have pain, that's fine, but, you know, they're walking with a limp or they're denying it or it's just stiff or they just don't register it as pain, that's all fine. But the reason they're not able to put the weight on their leg is because of the pain signals and, and it's shooting up to their brain. And so... That, and you can have a leg length, that's another, that you can have a leg, well, usually the cartilage is lost, so you're going to be short on that side, and so that's why you're walking with a, you know, in a hole all the time. So you can have a limp there as well um, from that, or just the stiffness. So the bone's rubbing on the bone, and it's like the door jammed, and then the bone's hitting the bone, and you don't have the motion that you had once before. And so that's why you can't move it around, that's why it's short, and then that's why it's painful. All those things can lead to a limp. After surgery, yes. The pain is gone, so you're not going to walk with a limp. The muscles, usually, I always say I take the bony block away in surgery with a, a hip or knee replacement. I, t I remove that problem of that, putting a mechanical device that can move all day, all around. But it's your muscles and your ligaments and your tendons and your capsule that's all been scarred down as well for so many years. Your hip hasn't moved for that many years, and it's not mobile. Your muscles, ligaments, and tendons are so contracted down and tightened over that. That's why rehab is, re or physical therapy is important, to get that to move, and then you'll stretch those muscles and ligaments with time. Exactly. And we also will typically lengthen the leg a little bit during a total hip replacement as well. Yes, but the longer you have it, it's probably harder to get away. It's not a 100% guarantee, but the longer you, if you had it for 20 years, do a hip replacement, it's very hard for your body to adjust that. There may no, be no reason for you to do it, but it may just be habit for your body to naturally fall into it, but it can be something that can be retrained. But they'll, usually the longer you've had it, the harder it is to get away. Yep. If we could take one more question, that would be great. We've got another presentation right after. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Is there a global type of question in there? I don't know. Uh, you had one. Let's see. Did you have one there? Uh, Dr. Johnson. Yep. Yeah, um, I, is, if your question is the rate of uh, infection in a total hip and knee replacement, every hospital has a different infection rate um, to it um, based to, um, you know, how many procedures they perform and things. Usually I quote about a 1 to 2 percent chance of getting a hip or knee replacement. So it's very uncommon, but it's a very real number, and it can happen. And, and when we catch that infection after having it done, whether you had it for 10 years, you had your teeth cleaned, and then you get an infection, whether you have it six weeks after the surgery, whether, you know, when it pops up, it's usually a 1 to 2 percent chance of occurrence. Well, thank you, Dr. Right. Johnson. Yep. Great presentation. Thanks. Thank you.